Hey, welcome back. It is form check on Friday. F-C-O-F. That's the series. That's what we do every Friday. Anyways, we're taking videos. We're looking at them. We're giving advice. We have another one of our wonderful powerlifting coaches here from Calgary Barbell. This is Danny. Hey, everyone. And Danny is a powerlifting coach as well as an accomplished athlete. What's your best equipped squat, Danny? 250 keys. Open for 250 keys. 250 kilograms. Anyways, she knows what the heck she's talking about. Yeah, so it's let's... also Thursday. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't tell them. You can't tell them that kind of stuff. People go crazy if they oh. found out it wasn't Friday every time we filmed. <laughs> All right, we're looking at Jake here. Jake is doing some squats. And we're going to read some context here. So he's worked on getting comfortable with four plates for about a year and finally felt ready to start jumping up and wait, hoping to hit 505 or more in the next month. He says he had a bad habit of squatting a few inches shy of parallel. Wonder if there are easy fixes for that. Overall, I feel strong enough to lift heavier, but the entire movement feels unstable. Uh, still new to using a belt. He's only been using a belt for about four months and uses it only for working sets. When he goes for higher reps with heavier weights, breathing gets more difficult. As the set goes on, not sure if the quality of the belt has anything to do with it. Maybe he's going too heavy too fast, or the belt is too tight or in the wrong place. What do you think, Danny? So I think this it's is high. like, yeah, it's it's high. Yeah. Sorry, man. It's high. Uh, <laughs> I think this is like one of those classic situations of just like trying to stay too upright um, and needing to embrace that more low bar position. Um, mm -hmm. This is very much like a high bar squat, which isn't the most forgiving positionally. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the first thing I noticed is just how much you struggle with getting this bar out. Yeah, it looks like, too high almost. There is no way that you're gonna get into a good position to squat after having to like fight the bar out of the rack and shrug it out with your shoulders like that. Right, like you're all over the place in terms of your bracing and tightness. Now, I understand that's an equipment like limitation, but what I would say is get some big heavy mats that you can put on the floor here that are gonna raise that up like, yeah. you know, it looks four like centimeters it has or something. Has the spacing? You can see there's a hole right under. Oh yeah, to maybe you can make lower. it one lower. If you can make it here instead of there, you are going to squat better. Yeah, because like, even period. the re-rack, um, there's gonna be a point where you're probably not gonna be able to rack that. It's gonna roll down your back a little bit and if you're having to tiptoe it up, you're gonna, you're gonna get stuck. Twist it in and it's gonna feel terrible. It's the most terrifying thing <laughs> in the whole world. So yeah, definitely working on getting more tight and more braced before you pick the bar. Like it really looks like you're kind of just getting under there and picking it up. I also, in your email, you mentioned that you worked on getting comfortable with four plates for about a year and then started jumping up in weight. And I just, I'm not sure that that programming philosophy is your best route, right? I don't think that getting comfortable with a specific weight range is necessarily how this all works and then you can just start like piling weight on or something well and like what did 405 look like the first couple of times you did it and then was it just like never being able to reinforce good positioning because it was always too much weight um then you're probably going to pick up some bad habits as well yeah and i mean obviously if you're squatting 475 for a double here like <clears throat> you got stronger you are stronger yes your depth needs work but you know, I think the big thing here is that this probably feels heavy because it is, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the biggest things that I would have you work on are, are gonna be the bracing. And like Danny said, classic case of just really trying to stay upright. I can see you kind of pull your head back here. You know, we've got this really upright position. The only thing that really happens in the first part of the range of motion is those knees go forward until they can't. Then we're forced to push the hips back. And because we're really extended, when we get to this neutral position, we're like, oh, that's that's got to be it. That's it, right? Because we run out of room in the hips because we're trying to force so much extension. When in actuality, kind of what we need to do is, is get out of this and get into this, yeah. right? Where your chest is going to be more there, right? You're going to be pulling your ribs down. 
probably loosening the belt a little bit, maybe working a little on your upper back position. Looks like our shoulders are pretty far forward, maybe shrugged up there. I would try to get the shoulders a little closer together and a little more depressed or down. And then I would learn how to hinge and like initiate your squat by taking this now very neutral range kind of block that we've created by learning how to brace and hinging, right? So that instead of going from, you know, this position to this position, we're going from this position to this position where now I, I know your torso is not that long. No, <laughs> nobody's torso is that long, but you get what I'm saying, right? So we're getting into this hinge as opposed to trying to arch to stay upright. And I think once we get that bracing down, you're gonna find depth way more comfortable. Definitely. Uh, you asked if there's a, a an easy fix for that. The easiest fix for squatting high is squat deeper. Well, and when your bar path is so off and you're unable to ma manage your center of mass, that's when we run into depth issues. You can see when you hit the hole here, the bar is coming forward, the shoulders are coming forward. It's gonna be really hard to sit any further back into the squat to hit depth if that bar is so far forward. So if you can manage your center of mass more effectively, you should be finding that it's easier to hit that depth. Yeah, and, and what I mean by the easiest way to squat deeper is to squat deeper. <laughs> is not, I'm not just, just trying to be a smart ass. I admittedly am being a bit of a smart ass with that comment, but <clears throat> the big thing you need to do is be practicing this on all of your warm ups and on all of your working sets and on all of your squats. You need to be practicing the brace. You need to be getting depth. If you're not filming your last few warm ups, you should be. Film them, make sure they're to depth. You know, if you've got 135 on there and we're not hitting depth, Take 135 a couple more times and get it in there. You know what I mean? Um, you also mentioned that you only wear the belt for working sets. That's probably okay. Generally, I advise people to put their belt on, you know, somewhere around 70%. Because if you do all of your warm ups to, let's say on this day, maybe your last warm ups like 450, 455. You take 450, 455 without your belt and you're like, oh, this feels good. Then you go to take 475. You change a bunch of stuff, i.e. adding a belt, cranking it on there, bracing differently, having very different feedback throughout the lift. And then you go to take your heaviest set for the day. Eh, like did those warm ups really prepare you as well as they could for the top set? Or could you be doing more in terms of keeping things specific from you know 70% and up so that you're better prepared to do a better job on your top set? Practice how you're gonna play. Exactly. Also not sure how much those knee sleeves are helping if they're over top of sweatpants, but. Yeah. But. I don't know. <clears throat> Lastly. Be hard to put on. <laughs> oh yeah, Jeez, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. Lastly, one thing that actually might be an easy way to get better depth is try out some squat shoes. Try out some lifting shoes with a little bit of a heel. In a lot of cases, that can allow you to get to depth without changing very much about technique at all. Now, I still definitely recommend that we work on bracing, but getting a squat shoe, which you can simulate, and don't do this with heavy weights. Like, you know, if you're squatting 475 for two, I want, I want you to take like 315 at most for this little experiment. But you can take one of these, set it in a place where you're gonna walk out to it so that your heel's just on it and try a few reps with a little bit of an elevated heel. Better yet, again, if you have a mat or something like that, something a little more flat and stable, but you can emulate or simulate a lifting shoe just by doing something to get your heel up a little bit. In a lot of cases, that's gonna make it easier for you to hit depth and, and just feel a lot better for some people. I've had some people, again, have the exact opposite reaction. Oh, definitely. Where switching to flats after squatting in heels for years and years is like, oh my God, why didn't I think of this earlier? But yeah, just something to try out. Um, yeah, I think that's probably about all I got. Yeah? I think that covers most of it. Yeah. Cool, all right, let's move on to the next one. All right, our next lifter is gonna be Chris, doing some deadlifts here. Now, Chris is currently training for his first comp. It says he really struggles at the top of the deadlift with balance, specifically. Uh, he also said he's 131 pounds body weight, and this is a 655 deadlift, so he's uh, he's clearly got some some strength. 
Uh, that's that's all he says. <laughs> Did he say he's got some strength? No, I, I, that that was me. That was me. That was me. That's a strong deadlift for uh, a pretty light lifter. So, what, what do you think? Any thoughts? Um, just from like a, my coaching perspective, I would probably ask that there was just like a little bit less slack in the straps. Um, it seems like you are getting it to hang a little bit lower in the straps than you would necessarily be able to do in a competition. Mm -hmm. And if we're going back to the point on like practicing how you're going to play, you want it to be as close to competition standard as you can. So you can recreate this in a competition setting and, uh, you know, not drop it. <laughs> yeah. Ideally. Yeah. And then it looks like this is likely a box gym of sorts. So maybe it's not the best bar. Um, hello. I see Nerling, so. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's hard to tell. <clears throat> I think. <sighs> so I think this is the. Oh, I don't know how to say this. This is the TikTok deadlift. This is the fingertip grip straps, grip on the smooth, bendy bar. Like, I'm not. I, I really don't want it to come off like I'm trying to take anything away from you. I still think this is a, a wonderful feat of strength. I think you're strong. All that stuff, you know, make make sure that stays in the in the foreground of what I'm saying here. But I do not think that you're gonna be able to go and replicate this in a competition given the way that you're training. Yeah. And I think that if <clears throat> you are looking to power lift, uh and compete in powerlifting, and that's a very different thing. Maybe you're looking to just kind of build a social media presence. Maybe you're, you, you know, you want to do like fitness influencer stuff. And if if so, like more power to you. This is probably um, a pretty direct route to a lot of that stuff. But we are going to address this from the perspective of somebody who's looking to compete in powerlifting. Now, yes, there are a lot of federations that are going to have a pretty pretty noodly bar, pretty bendy bar, um, but uh, like you're not, you know, your thumb isn't even on the bar. You know what I mean? Like we're really not mimicking uh, any kind of uh, grip that's going to give you anything resembling how you're going to have to grip the bar in competition, right? So at this point, this is where the bar breaks off the floor, right? If you move this up, probably a full inch, you have to move this down a full inch. Yeah. Right. So it's really going to change your positioning off the floor. Also. Uh, I know there are there are people out there who say you should be gripping on the smooth. I think that's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to be good at. And I think likely we're gonna have to widen the grip, again, from the perspective of a competing power lifter, so that you can actually hold on to the bar, right? I would 100%, if I were you, if I, you know, if you, if you hit my inbox and, and we decided we were gonna start as a, you know, coach and athlete, we would be ditching the straps. We would be ditching the bumpers. We would be trying to pull on a bar that's gonna emulate or simulate whatever we're using in competition. Maybe it is a bendy bar, in which case, go ahead. But we would be getting rid of the straps, not gripping on the smooth, and only pulling what we can actually hold on to. Uh, just because of that, all those things being requirements in competition, right? Now, I know you didn't ask about any of that, so maybe that's you know on the unsolicited side of things, but, in terms of the actual balance part of it, I would say that it's going to become more and more necessary as you get stronger and as the weight gets heavier to spend more time holding each and every lockout, right? So we kind of pull through there and then, you know, before the bar is fully settled, we're already setting it down. The biggest way to work on your deadlift balance is to make sure that you are locking out and selling every single rep. Right? I don't think, and maybe this part of the player can get out of here so we can... Okay, that's, that's really disruptive. <laughs> um, but so that we can see, right? It doesn't look like you're too toed out. And that's one thing that I see often um, is, is people get their feet a little too far out like this. And then they have very little, you know, very thin sort of base of support. Um, which makes it really hard to stabilize. But it doesn't look like you're, you're overly towed out. So I think the biggest thing that you're gonna need to do in order to work on that balance is number one, 
Like we're going into a hell of a lot of extension here. We're really driving the chest up. We're really pulling the head back. And I think some of those things could be a little bit more muted or a little bit less exaggerated, right? We're getting through it like, I don't know, maybe about there-ish, but trying to focus more on like getting the hips to lock and less on trying to pull your back through, right? Taylor always likes to talk about locking out up instead of locking out back. I think that's very much applicable in this situation. So I think some, some cues with your lock out there maybe, but also just, you know, trying to, trying to, what'd you say, practice like you play? Practice how you're gonna play, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a little bit more of that. And depending on what your game or your play looks like in terms of competition, you know, that's, this advice may or may not work, but that would be uh, my approach to trying, to trying to work on this deadlift. Yeah, I would agree. I did say he was looking to compete too, right? I'm pretty sure. He is training for his first comp, yeah. Yeah, so all of that advice is especially relevant training for your first competition. Um, find out what kind of bar you're gonna be on. Try to get a hold of one or go to a gym that has one. Ditch the straps. Your, your pull might take like a hundred pound hit at first, but honestly, at 130 pounds, if you're pulling 555, that's still pretty damn good. Definitely. Um, and you know, if you can get your bench, your, your, your grip strength to come up with your pull strength, you're gonna be a lot happier down the road, as opposed to getting to the point where you can pull 770 with straps and pull 550 with your grip, right? That's That hurts a lot more, ego-wise. And I mean, adapt the environment if you need to, like liquid chalk and regular chalk. If mm -hmm. your gym doesn't already have those things, bring them um, so you can emulate the competition setting and be ready. Cause it might drastically change your ability to get your hips into position. And then you may just <laughs> really find yourself struggling to pull it together on competition day. So I would take care of that sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. I've had lifters transition from a federation where they're using a, a deadlift bar, which is, which is pretty, pretty bendy to a federation where they're now having to use a stiff bar. Uh, and it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10%. Yeah, it's drastic. Uh, drastic enough. And it was like, that was a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Right, it was to be like, oh, dang. <laughs> and, and learning the patience off the floor because you don't have that whippy bar anymore. It's not bending, it's not giving you any give. So now this is a totally different sensation in the hardest part of the movement. And are you prepared for that? Yeah, yeah, so. Definitely do some research and, um, you know, I think you can still have a very successful meet. You just got to try to handle those variables and get things on the more specific track Definitely sooner rather than later. Deadlift specialist on the up. Just yeah, yeah, for sure. Fine tune a few things. All right. Up next, we have bench press. Isaac. So Isaac sent this in and says he feels like he loses tightness in his back and has weak leg drive. Uh, he's not sure what cues he should use to try to keep everything tight and solid. All right. Well, it looks like he had a great rack to bench out of at least, right? This is a lot better than a lot of the commercial gym racks we see where it's like, do you want to have to reach four inches above your usual setup or do you want to do half a rep to unrack? Totally. So, you know, you got that going for you. What do you think about the, the leg drive and tightness in the back? So right off the start here, you actually have a really nice position um, before you unrack the bar. Mm -hmm. Hips are really good, we got leg drive going, but then as you go to set your butt down, you just let everything go. Um, so you're losing the hip extension that we want to keep the tension through the lower body. Um, I tend to gravitate towards teaching people to learn leg drive in flats. I just find it's easier for people to learn how to push the floor away in flats rather than having that heel kind of distort how that feels. Right, fair um, And then also right now you're kind of starting with more of like a negative shin angle. If you want more leg drive, you're probably gonna wanna bring your feet forward just slightly. That's gonna help you get the- This one? Yeah. 
just the sensation of pushing the floor away from you a little bit better, which is gonna help you push back towards your rib cage. Right. So I like to think of like, I'm usually doing check-ins in an office chair, but um, if you're sitting in your office chair and you wanna move the chair back, you're gonna push the floor away from you. You want to create that same sensation when you're creating leg drive. And what you're trying to do there is you're trying to push force towards your rib, gauge, rib cage to elevate your ribs towards the bar. That's gonna keep the sternum high, that's gonna keep you into like a naturally retracted position um, and should create more leg drive. A lot of the time if we're bringing the feet far back, which is what we commonly used to see more in powerlifting, it's not as common anymore. You're gonna get more arch maybe, but you might not be able to feel leg drive, leg drive quite as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think definitely the biggest thing you know, that I would start with is, is what Danny said about kind of setting everything, getting really tight, getting into this good position, and then getting the bar out and kind of like all this extra wiggling after you get the bar out is just undoing your position. Well, yeah, and if you pause it in where he is getting set there, like okay. if you could maintain more of this and get your butt down, yeah. which would likely happen better with a more forward foot position, yeah. that's where we want to be. We want to see some extension through the hips. We want the lower body to look active and on. If I ask you to just kind of hold your bench position right here, like it should be a little bit challenging for you to do that when you're holding the weight over yourself. Yeah. We shouldn't just be kind of laying there waiting for the bar to come to our chest. Yeah, so at this point, like, I think we've kind of got all the elements in the right place. I do agree with Danny, especially for you, looking like maybe a bit of a longer, taller lifter, maybe having your feet out a little further. But I think if we can keep all of this tension and just barely, slowly let up on tension, just enough, just enough, just enough until your butt's on the bench, and then keep every single thing locked in from now until the time you re-rack that bar, that's gonna be how we create and maintain tension. Yeah, and at first it might feel like your butt's not on the bench. Yeah. But yeah. if you're creating and you're applying the floor, the force uh, in the right direction by pushing away rather than just down, the butt will stay down and mm -hmm. will stay in contact with the bench. Yeah. And I think even here, like we're looking maybe a bit shrugged up. Yeah. I think a lot of times one of the things I like to cue lifters to do is to pull the bar out just this like last little bit. So once you unrack the bar, and get it kind of where you want to get it. I like to cue lifters to just, just pull it like a millimeter further down because a lot of times what'll happen is you'll, you'll feel forced to depress your shoulder blades a little harder and that'll bring your chest up a little bit more and it just, it just creates the last little bit more tightness. Cause right now it looks like we're kind of back here with it, right? Where I think if we pull that bar down lower, we're gonna get those shoulders down with it we're gonna shorten the range of motion, set better tightness in the upper back. But yeah, I think my biggest gripe is with this right here, right? So you set your butt down and then we're doing a bunch of resetting of the shoulders and a bunch of resetting of the feet. Like before you lift that bar out of the rack, be set. Once you lift the bar out of the rack, nothing changes. At least from like, you know, armpit down. All this should be just locked for the entirety of the set past that point. And I think that kind of can't be understated. In terms of the press itself, looks like honestly you're doing a pretty decent job with you know the bar path, touch point looks relatively consistent. We're maybe getting a little loose on the chest. We're I think losing some position as we lock out there. So we get to the top, we're really kind of locking through and seeing some more shoulder movement as the, uh, as the bar locks out, but. Yeah, so one thing I like to work on with that is making sure when you are pressing the weight off your chest, like that action isn't coming from your shoulders. If you're really pressing through the shoulders, you're gonna end up in that protracted position. If you're doing a set of five, it's gonna be very difficult by the end and probably put some like strain on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, so if you can focus on keeping the chest up and keeping that retraction, and then rather just like extending through the tricep, pushing your tricep like towards the plate, um, that should get you in a good position to be able to maintain the retraction that you've set. Yeah, and kind of, Conversely to what we've talked about with some of the deadlift cues where we're trying to think arms long, I actually like to try to get lifters to think arms short on the mm -hmm. bench, right? Like you want to lock out as close to your chest as you can almost. And that's really going to keep you in that retracted, in that depressed position. And, you know, it is going to trim your range of motion a little bit. And then, I mean, you look like, 
you look like you got a bench like mine where you know you got those deadlift arms and you're having to press at a friggin' long ways so anything you can do to kind of give yourself a bit of an advantage there i think is worthwhile all right and our last lifter for today is rasmus um so he says with his long femurs sometimes wonders if back flexion is something to be concerned about it doesn't give him problems three years of lifting seriously so far uh, and he says he would lift much less if he had to try to keep his back straighter. He also notices, notices he has a habit of kicking the bar out a bit when he leans back to pull the slack. And lastly, he's not sure how he can, sorry, he doesn't yet understand how he can allow some thoracic rounding while keeping the lumbar fixed. So let's watch this again here. It honestly, it looks pretty good. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought, actually, as I was looking through. I think in terms of kicking it out, like, just let let there be a little bit of space between your, uh, between the shin and your, and your bar there. Yeah, I think in, like, the origins of, like, powerlifting growing, people were really wanting everybody to start with it right against the shins. Yeah. And that would protect your back, but... Um, that extra friction uh, isn't helping you on the way up and then kicking it forward in the start is also not helping you. So don't be afraid to start it a little bit further forward uh, yeah. and allow your knees to come forward just that little bit. Yeah, I definitely am not worried about the amount of flexion your back's going through. No. I, and I, I, so I very, very rarely worry about back flexion from uh, like an injury standpoint, unless of course the lifter's having pain and you know, those issues are cropping up. More so, I would look at it from potentially a, a performance standpoint. And I think in this case, it, you might even be able to do a little bit more flexion because it looks like on some of these reps, we're really trying to be flatter. And as we start the rep, we're kind of getting pulled into this position. I would just reinforce this position. Like this is a great position. There's nothing wrong with that at all from a performance or an injury prevention standpoint, you know, try to just like leave that chest that little bit forward right because i think in this last instant here you kind of do this extra motion to like try to pull this tighter and flatter like let those arms hang a little bit more because by the time we're here we end up with that flexion coming back with those shoulders kind of moving back out of the position you're setting them in um i think we could maybe be a little more patient off the floor Right, we could we could lean a little more into the push and less into the pull, um, you know, kind of keeping these knees more forward off the floor. Right, we are seeing a fair bit of the knees kicking back off the floor. I think you could kind of just let the knees stay forward for a little bit longer in the movement. Um, but yeah, other than that, like for the most part, this looks like some really good deadlifting here need more weight yeah um and i don't i know you said you you don't understand how to allow some thoracic rounding while keeping the lumbar fixed uh i think what i would say there is just kind of working on the bracing and i think right now you're thinking that the bracing is like trying to extend your back when in actuality the bracing should be trying to get downward pressure from the lats and the back of the rib cage and downward pressure on the front from the front of the rib cage, right? Your, your bracing should be more of like this and this sort of compression than trying to pull back or like drive the chest out. And I think that'll coincide with the arms longer and, you know, keeping your, your trunk more where it is throughout the lift. Because I can even see some tendency when you're setting it back down, right? Like you're really going into a lot of extension as you go to try to set it down, right? Like there's a real tendency for you to want to try to get into this position over and over and over again throughout these sets. And I think we just have to learn that like, it's okay for those shoulders to be a little bit more forward. It's okay for that rib cage to be more pulled down into the abs kind of thing. Anything else you see there or want Not to necessarily. comment on? I think sometimes like embracing the position you end up in as the strongest position is like a good mentality to have sometimes. Um, what's 
good on paper or in a textbook might not work for you and for your leverages. So um, embracing that difference and trying to strengthen that area. Um, something that I've been kind of working on because I actually end up really flexed as well through my upper back after even years of trying to be very upright um, is some direct core work where I'm like in that kind of flex position. Mm. So taking a weight on like the uh, back extension machine and getting into that slightly flex position, holding the plate and learning how to brace in that position because um, like, you know, lying leg raises and things like that, they're not really showing us how to brace in mm -hmm. that weighted position. Whereas this, you know, you're holding that load and you're holding that flex position and learning how to engage your core like you would in one of the compound lifts. Yeah. Um, and you can also practice it in like your rowing as well, right? Like be strict with your rowing and try to have a more flex position in, in the start. So those are some things that I personally work on. I like that actually quite a bit. When you're, when you're doing those, do you incorporate any like any hinging or are you just kind of using it as more of like a static hold? Yeah, it's like an isometric hold. Um, okay. I am hinging a little bit uh, on this machine here, mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm rowing, I'm also actually, I guess, hinged a little bit and trying to be really strict. And then as I come forward, really letting the shoulders out and maintaining that and not trying to retract and depress all the mm -hmm. time because um, I don't necessarily think that that is, you know, great for the deadlift, but as transferable for sure, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, well, there's some strategies for even, you know, thinking about and training the brace a little bit differently, uh, which I actually quite like. So uh, we're gonna call it there for the day. We're gonna be back again next week. Not sure if Danny's gonna be here or not, maybe. <laughs> Vote below. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you wanna submit your videos, there's stuff in the description box below. Check out the Calgary Barbell training app or send in a submission to be coached by one of our wonderful Calgary Barbell coaches, perhaps. Hey. Calgarybarbell.com. You can check all that stuff out. Thanks again to Danny for yeah, coming in for and me. hanging out, spending some time trying to make everybody better lifters. Where can people find you? Danny CBB. Danny underscore CBB. That's the one. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everyone.